Thank you, Don. Yeah, so I will like officially welcome everyone to this first episode in our OEB task series. Um, it's called Building a Different L&D in 2021. So with, with this series, uh, we broadcast the latest views and insights from the world of digital learning and training. Maybe some of you know me already, but my name is Hanna. I'm the program director of Online Educa Berlin, which is Europe's leading conference on online learning. And we have our 27th edition coming up from December 1st to 3rd. Mm. So, yeah, our speaker today, everyone has heard from him, is uh, Donald Taylor. He's the chair of OEB's Learning Technologies Conference track. And as we know, he's uh, passionately committed to helping to develop the L&D profession. Um, and this is a great time for L&D. Uh, we're aware that many of you will be using this year to build a new way of working. And in this session, we look forward to discussing how you'll be able to do so on solid foundations based on Don's uh, L&D Global Sentiment Survey. So Don, I don't know the, how many, have, which number of the sentiment survey is it? This is the eighth year of the survey. The eighth year already. Okay. So at OEB in early December, we'll be going into more depth into the topics that will be discussed today amongst others. And I'd also like to mention that if you would like to become a speaker, you can uh, always get in touch with me. I'll uh, show the slide here and also my contact information later, also at the end of this session. So in this session, as you've seen, we'll use the chat panel and there will be a Q&A panel as well. So we really look forward to picking up on your comments and questions throughout. But right now, let's get straight to the part you've been waiting for. I'm very pleased to hand over to Don. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, great to be here, everybody. Um, and very much looking forward to sharing with you the results of my Global Sentiment Survey and talking about those results and trying to get a lesson from them, the lesson being how to build new, different LMD. Uh, but of course, uh, as I always want to say, I'm conveying information here and the survey which I run every year is really as much as anything else a way of asking questions rather than trying to present you with answers. So let's make sure that we, we see it in the right light. So just to make clear what you've got in front of you, you've got some slides from me, you've got the uh, a video of me at the top, which I'm not sure adds a great deal of, of, of value. You've got a, a chat uh, box in the middle. Looking forward very much to hearing your chat there. Also, there's a, a box for questions for presenters. Now, the chat may get a bit busy, so please do put the questions in that box under the slides, questions for presenters. And we'll also be having a couple of places where we change the layout in order to get a bit more interaction. So, hola to Anna from um, Barcelona and Thomas, I, I can't say um, good morning or good afternoon in Danish, but great to have you with us. And great to have everybody with us. We're going to crack on now. And I've got quite a lot of content. Don't worry. Uh, I believe this is all being recorded and the recording will be made available afterwards. And also, uh, we'll make sure that you can get the slides, but uh, importantly, also the report itself afterwards. Uh, and we'll give you the links at the end. I want to say thank you to the sponsors who make it possible for me to do this. The five things we want to get through today are on the screen there. Probably the bits where we'll spend the most time are on number two, the key themes, I'm looking in detail in a couple of areas. And on number four, where next? That's where I want to take the results and look into it in a bit more detail and ask ourselves, all right, if that's what we're saying this year, then what does that mean for the development of learning and development? All right, let's start on with the first of the four of the five sections here. I ask a question every year to the learning development community worldwide, and it's one question. Now, actually, this year there were three questions in total, but there's one obligatory question. What will be hot in learning and development next year, in workplace learning and development next year? This is, as Hannah said, year eight of the survey. I give people a list of 15 things to choose from. They can choose three of the options. And well, more than 3,000 people voted this year from 95 countries, and they were spread 91% of them across these six different regions. I'm aware that Africa and Asia are underrepresented, and I'll be making deliberate moves to get those represented properly next year. Nonetheless, this is the only survey of its type that looks into how people are feeling about the world of L&D rather than what their plans are, and there's a reason for that. What I'm doing when I ask this survey, and I want to 
just get this down quickly before we look into the results. What I'm doing when I ask this question is I'm trying to get a sense of the sentiment. How do people feel about this? Now, because of the way I ask people to contribute by email, by social media, and because of the nature of the question itself, this is not a representative sample. You're familiar with this, this curve, the Everett Rogers diffusion of innovation curve. This, this population that I get to answer this question all come from almost certainly one part of the curve, which is the innovator and early adopter. They are self-selecting people interested in technology. That's where they are in the curve. So you may ask, Donald, why is that interesting then? And the answer is, and the reason why I started this survey, is that I'm interested not really so much in what people are talking about this year, but I'm interested in what's going to become popular in four and five years time, because it's not the case that everything that the innovators and early adopters are interested in goes on to become widely adopted. But it is the case that everything that is widely adopted by the early majority and the late majority, all of those things at some point were found interesting by the people over on the left hand side of the curve. So in other words, I'm interested in the few ideas that make it, that succeed and move from innovator early adopter popularity to the early majority and wider adoption. So what I'm looking for always when I ask the survey is, okay, what's interesting this year, but what's going to go on to become more widely accepted and adopted? Okay, here are the 16 options plus, well, 15 options plus other that I put out there and ask people to vote on. I'd just like your votes and your thoughts quickly. There's two boxes underneath the slide here. But you can see on the left-hand side, which of these things do you think is going to be the most popular? Could you just write in that box there uh, underneath what you think is the most popular one or will be the most popular this year? That's the one on the left-hand side. And if you want to go into more information about it, why do you think that's important? Please put that in the other box where I've got why question mark, question mark at the top. I'm gonna to have a sip of water and watch your responses come in. Everyone's different. That's really interesting. Of course, the results have been shared internationally, so you may already know what the, uh, what the answer is. Microlearning, says Rihanna. Charles is saying virtual and augmented reality. James, collaborative social. Tim, reskilling, upskilling, reskilling, upskilling, uh, agrees. Geraldine, artificial intelligence, says Patrizia. And Nicola agrees there. Virtual reality, says Patrizia also. Other, says Fola. I can tell you other is never number one on the list. Um, but if you've got another idea, ah, so Fola says, wellness and resilience are interesting. I'll come to that later on, uh, Fola, because that was something that cropped up in the other section quite a lot. So there's a really wide variety of answers coming through in the, in, in the question, who, what do you think will be most popular? I'm interested that coaching and mentoring is coming through, Mariella's saying that, because that's something I believe is longer term going to be very popular and, and will be very widely adopted with technology support. We didn't see much of that this year. Um, a lot of support for collaborative learning and reskilling upskilling, but we'll, we'll come to that in a second. Now, looking at the why section, Charles has coined a word, fidgetal, which I think is a combination of digital and physical, which I like. Geraldine is saying we've got constant change, so we have to adapt to what, uh, what we're doing. Uh, James has pointed out, James voted for social uh, and collaboration. Good to have you with us, James. The use of social is now a norm, and sharing knowledge gains kudos, so that's why we're doing that. A lot of the reason. A lot of the reasons in that why box, interestingly, are about change, and particularly about change that's been introduced, I think, by COVID. So Ian's saying new working patterns, um, and Nicola's referring to change. Uh, look, uh, at this stage, if we were doing a face-to-face -face, uh, session and we had time, I'd say, look, let's stop having the lunch break. Let's just break out into groups and have a conversation about this, and it would be fantastic. And I'm going to press on with the presentation. Um, but thank you very much for all your thoughts. Right, I'm going to, of course, as we say in English, pull the rabbit out of the hat like I'm a conjurer, and I'm going to show you what the answers are. What, what did people vote for? And thank you for sharing your thoughts. And we'll, we'll come back and we'll have more opportunity to share that 
in the uh, rest of the presentation. So that's one way of looking at the results. And with the results here, you can see previous year ranking is shown in brackets. And you can also see that um, there's one new option this year. Every year I take something on, I put something off. Reskilling, upskilling was new this year. And I took off video. Okay, I want to just look at the key headlines from these results now because they are pretty extraordinary in many ways and I've never had a year like it. Okay, so the, the key results are number one, that reskilling upskilling came in completely new at number one. I'm going to explore that in more detail in a minute. I'm also going to explore collaborative and social learning. If you look at the arrows on the right hand side of this table, it's all red arrows pointing down or arrows saying it's the same percentage of voters last year. Okay, to make, Anne say, can you make the slide bigger? Yes, you can. Uh, if, you, if you put your, your mouse over it, you should be able to go, you should be able to go full screen by clicking a, the, the, the rightmost button that will appear at the top. And James is just gonna type in some thoughts here. James, okay. So James is correct. If you go to the top right hand corner of the slide uh, and if you click the, there's a button there which says go full screen, that will enable you to, to um, see the full presentation. You won't see me, which is no loss. You won't see the chat, but you can toggle backwards and forwards quite quickly to, uh, to get that. And, and thank you for bringing that point up. Um, so the, the arrows on the right hand side uh, show that everything is moving down. And apart from one thing, you're very sweet, Anne. everything's moving down apart from one thing, the second option, though, collaborative and social learning. And that actually has gone up in comparison with last year. So that vote of 9.4% for collaborative and social learning is more than it got last year. And we'll have a look at why collaborative and social learning rebounded this year when everything else has been pushed down by, by reskilling and upskilling, sucking up all those votes at the top. And the third major point this year, the, the pink or the, the light orange uh, coded one here, is that the hot technologies have fallen this year. Artificial intelligence was five last year and it's dropped to number 12 this year. And virtual and augmented reality, also something that's very hot and sexy and new, has also dropped down. So I'm going to investigate why that is. Um, I'm going to go on to another slide now. Now, if you're Again, these slides are difficult, may be difficult to read if you're on, depending on the device you're on. So if you want to see the slide in full detail, then please do go to the top, hover to the right hand side of the uh, top right hand corner of where the slides are, and you'll see the go full screen button. If you click that, then the thing will, will expand and you'll be able to see the whole thing. I, I just want to make the point about reskilling here, that reskilling is number one, and it's not number one just because a few people voted for it in one area um sorry i've had a question in the chat and yes i'm using the app definitely i'm not using the browser um not reskilling and upskilling is absolutely number one across everywhere so at the beginning i mentioned that i asked one obligatory question, two voluntary questions. One of the voluntary questions was, where do you work? And there were five answers and across all of those five answers. So working in a workplace, learning and development team, self-employed as a freelancer or a contractor, working in education, working for a vendor or indeed other, in all of those five options, reskilling was the most popular choice. Across each of our six regions, remember 91% of the votes come from those six regions. Across each of those six regions, apart from one, look at those blue bars. Reskilling and upskilling is number one. And the bar where it's not um, number one is on the far right hand side, that's South America. That's where we've got our smallest number of votes, so it may be skewed by sampling. So, and, and also the reskilling and upskilling vote in those five regions is very tight. There's only 1.5% difference, difference between them. In the past, we've seen one region dominate an idea, and then that pulls the overall percentage up. That's not happening here. Reskilling and upskilling is seen as being hugely important 
across the globe, wherever you work. Never had that before, it's extraordinary. Um, I'm gonna go over to here, so we've got a bit more space for the slides as well. Please, if you've got any questions, do drop the questions into the uh, questions box, uh, box under, the, uh, under the slides. So let's look at those key themes in a bit more detail and try to answer some of the questions we've got about them. Reskilling, upskilling is number one. Collaborative and social learning, we've seen has bounced back from last year. Nothing else has, and the hot technologies have fallen. I want to just quickly look at why that is. But again, I'm going to take a sip of water and ask you for your input. I've talked about reskilling and upskilling here without defining it. Now, I don't define anything on the survey because I want to get people's immediate reaction. And anyway, if I did define things, people wouldn't read the definitions. We know that from experience. So, reskilling and upskilling, what does it mean? Well, I'd like your answer on that, please. That box, the big box underneath the slides, what does that mean for you, reskilling and upskilling? Drop the, um, your answers into the chat, into the, um, the, the uh, box under the slide. And let's have a look. <laughs> Charles has answered by saying, well, it's the $1 million question, right? Well, it is, Charles, but what's your answer to it? Um, okay, so some answers here. So Leah is saying, it, it, reskilling and upskilling gives a competitive edge. Possibly to the individual, possibly to the organisation. Geraldine, making sure I can continue to add value to the organisation as an L&D manager. I think that's a really interesting answer. Anne says, researching and understanding new ways of working. That's a constant theme we're going to come up with for the rest of this presentation. Thank you, Anne. Um, Joanna says, yeah, continuously filling a skills gap as job requirements change. I'm going to go into it in more detail. That's definitely a strong part of it. Now, Bert's made the, made the key point that reskilling typically means that you reskill when you're shifting from one set of skills for a job to a new set of skills for a job. And Mariella's pointed out improvement and extension. So, uh, Reskilling probably is improvement and upskilling is extension. So you extend what you know already. And the rest of the um, definitions look good. Charles is saying, my point being, we can't seem to define it. You may be right, Charles. Uh, I think I think it's I think Charles, you're sort of right. It's it, for me, it's more that there are a number of definitions, all of which are correct, but it makes this a very big bucket that people can feel excited about. Christine has said, uh, trends in the digital age, yes, undoubtedly this is a huge, huge thing in the digital age, and we have to make sure people have the skills to work in the digital age. Yeah, okay, so I'm liking all the definitions. I'm liking the real breadth of this, by the way, and the, the extent to which people clearly are thinking about this, um, possibly. <laughs> Now, James has said in the chat, if we had unlimited budgets, I suspect the answers would be different. Yeah, that's true. But of course, one of the, one of the great issues with L&D is we don't have unlimited budgets and the making the choices is one of the great things that we have to wrestle with. Okay, James sums it up. Upskilling is uh, a, a, an increase in the skills you know. Reskilling is replacing skills you know, or, or perhaps you keep those skills, but you, you have new skills for a new job. All right. I'm going to move forward with the presentation and going to cover some ground here and then go on to those other points in the, um, in, the, in the agenda that I mentioned. Now, if you do a Google search on the trends for reskilling and upskilling, um, you'll notice that it's not something which is a recent term. The, the terminology was of interested searches around reskilling and upskilling were bubbling along until about until about January 2019, as you can see. And then they suddenly picked up. And if you actually go back in the literature, you can see there were certain things that happened that made people interested in these two terms. For example, a conference in Bucharest in June 2019 run by the EU on upskilling or the reskilling revolution, a very influential paper reduced, produced by the World Economic Forum in January of 2020. Uh, these, if you, it, it's actually possible to go to the graph and find the week after one of these events happened and there's an uptick in interest in the particular uh, topic. 
The point about this is for me is that a lot of people have been talking about reskilling and upskilling as if it's a recent thing. It's not. It's been around for a long time. And in fact, I was reading on Friday a paper from, 19, from 2019 about reskilling and upskilling from PwC. It was in January 2019. So it's been around for a while. And here is some of the pattern of the ways in which the terms have been used over the past two years. So I run the survey in December and January. So December 2020, January 2019. By the time we got to December last year, people had already had about two years of people talking about reskilling and upskilling in different ways. If you look at these headlines here, you can see on the left-hand side, early on, they're talking about reskilling and upskilling because it's the future of the workforce. We have the issue of work changing and we have AI automating work. We've got talent gaps in the middle and then over the right-hand side, it's all about the impact of COVID. My point is this, when people are answering a survey, they don't just pluck an idea out of their head, freshly minted. What always happens is that people search for something that's going to describe what they're doing. They go to what I call the ambient wordscape. It's a, it's a phrase I've made up, but it means that we're always surrounded by words that are in general use and we don't always recognize it. But sometimes we'll pluck a word out and we'll use that because it happens to be one that's been familiarized by a lot of use. And that's exactly what happened with reskilling and upskilling. We were faced with some real work in the 12 months of last year, running leading up to the survey. In the public sector, you had a lot of work in, in national and supranational organizations about the future of the workforce and about apprenticeships. Private sectors were very focused on these things, talent gap, automation, and so on. All of these things were racking up. So whether it was a supranational organization or you're dwelling, drilling down right to what's happening at L&D activity, there was something that you could think, yes, I've been really busy doing that, or that's been on my mind, and the term reskilling and upskilling fits it. So Charles, to come back to your point, nobody can define it. I think you're, you're sort of right. My point is, actually, there are lots of definitions out there. And because there are so many definitions, we've pinged a lot of different activities to the term reskilling and upskilling. I'm going to be writing a paper between now and the summer, looking at this in more detail, looking at what exactly is happening with reskilling and upskilling, and looking at these different areas in order to dwell down, sorry, drill down in more detail. So what exactly is going on? Undoubtedly, there is a lot of great work taking place. And I think we need to uncover what exactly we mean when we use this term. Okay, let's switch from that first key uh, finding to the second key finding, which is collaboration. Now look, in the past, on the survey, two topics have dominated the survey, personalization and collaboration. They have been number one or number two for most of the running of the survey up to last year when learning analytics became number one. So although you see here a dropping vote for collaboration and social learning, it was still number one or number two for all of those years of the survey. It was just that the overall vote was coming down. You'll see that 2016, it was at 13% and it fell all the way down. And then in 2020, last year, there was a flattening out. And this year, there's been a hiccup. It's bounced back. Why is that? My view is that we've moved with this from it being seen as being a theoretical idea to something that's practically implementable. And I think that this process started in 2006 with the release of Informal Learning by Jay Cross, which was a, a hugely influential book that got people really thinking about the idea that we don't, that, that learning is not synonymous with doing a course, that we learn in lots of ways, and a course may be a small percentage of what we learn, that it usually is. So what Jay was saying transformed the way people thought about learning. And lots of people were talking about social learning, but most people weren't really doing it. So it remained something people thought was hot, but they weren't really able to pin down how they should do it. And I think that changed last year. Last year, we had people using Zoom, Slack, uh, Yammer, uh, Teams, communication tools to share information all the time. And it worked. It wasn't perfect, but it worked. And what we have then was it moving from being an ideal to a reality. Yeah, actually we can make this work. And by the way, if 
as was happening last year, learning and development is maxed out and super busy, getting people to use these tools to learn is probably a good idea. So that's, I think, what happened last year and why that was the only option to actually increase its share of the vote. OK, I'm going to go over to some more tables now, which you might want to, again, put your cursor in the top right hand corner of the screen if you want to uh, and, and click the um, go full screen button. Although, actually, you don't need to read these slides, strangely enough. You can just look at the colours because this is the story that I'm going to tell. Over five years of the Global Sentiment Survey, what happens with most of the options is that they go down. Because I pick something when it looks like it's going to be interesting and it, maybe it then jumps up, but then over the course of the years it comes down. So you can see here that there are four things I picked out in different colours. Micro learning is the pink one, then you've got mobile delivery, which is the, uh, the orangey one, then curation in grey and video in blue. And my point here is that although things make their way down the table, that doesn't necessarily always mean the same thing. The question, remember, is what will be hot next year? Well, if something has moved from being something which was exciting to something that has been something we're just used to using, then maybe it's just not so exciting anymore. It's not hot, even if it's become business as usual. So what's happened here is that you can see that these things dropping down, of the four things I've highlighted, three of them, micro learning, mobile delivery and video, are moving down the table because, hey, they are, they're just slowly being adopted and they're part of business as usual. You had the gray one there, made its way down the table. I've, I've highlighted that, that's curation. Curation for me is what I call a wallflower, which is an English term, English language term for somebody who comes to a dance but doesn't actually dance. They stand at the edge of the dance floor watching. And that's what happened with curation. It's been talked about a lot and it's been introduced into what we're doing, but nobody's really using it explicitly or very few people are. And so it's something which one group of people feel excited about, but has failed to excite general interest. So if we think about those technology things, technology options that I was talking about, what's happened with them? Why is it that virtual reality and artificial intelligence, the two really hot technologies I talked about a few slides ago, why have they failed? Look, here's virtual reality and augmented reality. They've been slowly becoming less popular as time has gone by, and I think they are like curation. They have been ex an exciting idea that has great use in some parts of our industry, but typically they're not going to be widely spread. So I think this is a straightforward, VR, AR is a straightforward matter of something that just has failed to get traction. But what about artificial intelligence? If you look at that, that started off uh, at uh, point eight on the table in 2017, rose up, almost got to number one, and started falling away. Looking at that pattern, you'd expect it this year to be at seven or eight, but in reality, it's dropped down to 12. It's fallen 3.3% this year, five, sorry, uh, seven places, and that's phenomenal. It's never happened before in the, in the history of the survey. And I think what's happened here is really just a bit of bad luck for artificial intelligence. What's happened is, it was always going to go off the boil. It was coming down because people were excited about the potential and then realized that actually it was a bit more difficult to make it happen. And that's the classic pattern of what happens with the Gartner hype cycle. People get super excited, yeah, and then uh, it's actually more difficult to make this work. It falls down into the trough of disillusionment. And what's happened is, talking to people this year in L&D, is that I've discovered, talking to people, that they are just being super maxed out trying to make things happen. The idea of extending themselves to implement artificial intelligence has just been shoved to one side. And it will come back. It will come back. But it will slowly come back. It's got to climb up the slope of enlightenment. And it may not come back as artificial intelligence, but bundled in with something else. Um, James has raised a point about virtual classrooms, which if we have, if we have time, we'll, we'll deal with that one at the end. Um, I used to have virtual classrooms on the survey, James. I took it off because nobody was using them. I wish I'd kept it on there now, but, you know, I can't predict what the future is going to show. Just want to have a quick look across the regions because um, we have 
three reason, three major regions here I want to have a look at and look at the, the difference uh, between them. Thomas, uh, I'll come back to your AI point um, at the end. I have a certain sympathy with it, but I'll, I'll come back to that at the end as well in the Q&A. On this table here, you can see we've got Europe in blue, North America, that's the NA, is in orange, and in grey, we've got the UK, uh, reflecting our weather patterns. And you can see, as I expressed earlier, there's a real tight grouping around the idea of reskilling, upskilling. They're all on top of each other on the top line. But I'd like to draw your attention to the other, to two other points here. Firstly, with North America, I just want to point out there's a characteristic that North America has shown all the time I've been doing this survey, which is that personalization every year in the North American continent scores more highly than collaboration. And for me, that may be a cultural representation. It may be simply a matter that personalization is seen to be more important than the collective experience. Or it may be a, a, a reflection of the experience of people in North America with high consumer grade personalization activity in their daily lives, whether it's watching television or going shopping, and that being reflected in what they expect to see in how they conduct training activities. So that's just one trend I wanted to bring your, to your attention. And the other one is this one, that personalization is, there's a, that's where we have the biggest difference between continental Europe and the UK. That in Europe, the personalization side is being is seen as being above uh, North America. So it's, it's quite, it's very strong. In the UK, it's far less. Now in the UK in the past, personalization has been strong. It's fallen away recently. I don't have an explanation for that. I'm just drawing it to your attention. Let's have a look specifically at the COVID effect. By the way, I'm loving the questions. I'm not ignoring them. Please feel free to keep using that box under the uh, slides there to drop questions in for me. We have time at the end. I'm going to pick up on them and answer them as swiftly as I can. So thank you for keeping to keeping answering, keeping answering keeping asking the questions, James, Thomas, and, and everybody else who wants to chip in. I said at the beginning that there were three questions. Firstly, what's hot? Secondly, where do you work? And the third question, an optional open text question, how will your learning and development work change as a result of COVID-19? Now, an open text question, I wasn't expecting a lot of answers to this, but 44% of people answered this. It's a total of 24,000 something words, and that's, that's actually, the equivalent of the book Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So I had to read a whole book's worth of stuff just to go through these responses for your benefit. Now, the big change, as you would expect, is that people were talking here about, I'm going to do more stuff digitally. And you can see this in the word cloud. So if you look at that word cloud, there's, I've only taken two words out. The word will, because that would dominate it, we're talking about the future, and the word learning, because after all, that's what we do. Taking those two words out, that's what's left. And you can see that overall, what's jumping out is, I'm going to have online, virtual, remote, digital training. <laughs> All those words are pointing to the same thing. The word face, by the way, is there because of the phrase face to face. So whenever somebody used that phrase, it appeared twice. So that's why face is there. But there's one other word that jumped out at me when I looked at this word cloud and then went to explore through this long list of responses. That's the word at the top there, focus. So I went and did a pass through all of the comments, found where it said focus, and focus on turned out to be the most popular phrase with two words in it. So what were people focusing on? There were three things. Firstly, Naturally, on the left-hand side, their number one, they were talking about delivery, focusing on doing things digitally, new delivery mechanisms, fair enough. But on the right-hand side, I think it's very interesting, the second most common thing people were focusing on was literally, that phrase, more, more focus on supporting the business, more focus on adding value, focusing on performance. So that phrase was coming out again and again to relate to doing stuff with the organization that I wasn't expecting. Now, it's not a huge number of people, maybe 10% of people working in learning and development, but it's a substantial number of people looking at 
changing what they're doing. That's why the word focus on, I find interesting because it means I'm going to shift what I'm doing. That gives me hope, people focusing more on the business. And then at the bottom, it's sort of between the two of them is helping the organization do a better job by focusing on more digital skills for the workforce. So that sort of makes sense being between the two, number three. All right. I'd like to look now at the ramifications of all of this. What does it mean? And what, where do we think we're going next? In my overall population, it's perfectly possible to, to divide the audience of the, the surveyed population up between two groups. I call them group A and group B. And group A responds to the initial canvassing the votes. I put stuff out on social media only. And that, I do that for a month, and that set of responses is predictably different from the set of responses I get from people who respond by email. It, it's, it's extraordinary, but if you respond to a social media request, you're different. And by doing other research, by talking to people and so on, I've come to the, some conclusions about this. Group A, uh, look at their responses, are definitely keen on innovation. They like methodology. They are on social media. They tend to be enthusiasts and their opinion leaders in the sense that they're the people who will throw ideas up in the air. Group B typically look at their answers so in the past three years, tend to be they prefer the familiar, they like technology. They are on email because that's how they're responding. These people tend to be more pragmatic. They tend to be people who are making decisions about stuff rather than people who are just interested in the ideas. And looking at our curve that we looked at earlier on, Group A tend to be, I'd call the innovators, more or less, and Group B are more like the early adopters. So for me, I'm very interested in seeing what will Group B get excited about? Remember the arrow going from left to right? Group A can talk about stuff all they want, but if Group B don't get excited about something, it's never going to make it over to the early majority and the late majority, it won't get adopted more widely. If you remember, I said, that's what I'm really interested in finding out about. Sorry, to answer the question, uh, James, I've just seen that. AI equals artificial intelligence. Yes, thank you for, for doing that. So look, Group A and Group B. Group A is a fairly small group. It's only 340 people. And group B is a much bigger group. These are people I can absolutely identify as having responded either to social media or to... Um, uh, an email invitation to vote. This is the same pattern that we've had in the past. Learning analytics is rated very highly by Group A and so is performance support, but they're rated less highly by Group B. Why? Possibly, possibly Group B think that they are less interesting and more difficult to actually implement in the workplace. Remember, Group B are pragmatic. But in Contrast, Group B are more enthusiastic about coaching and mentoring and more enthusiastic about mobile delivery. Well, Group A, group, group A are, the excited, are the excited people who want to do the latest thing. They're not going to be excited by mobile delivery because that was number one uh, eight years ago when I first did the survey. That's old now. It's not hot. And coaching and mentoring for these people falls in the same category. It's, yeah, so what? Coaching and mentoring, we know it happens. It's not exciting. Group B are excited about it, and I think actually Group B are, are right to be excited. I think there's some big changes happening there. But what I find very interesting, looking at Group A and Group B, is the notion of value in two ways. Firstly, there are two options that refer to this. Showing value, which just generally means anything around ROI, impact studies, and so on, and consulting more deeply with the business, which is how you find out what's going to be valuable. And if you look at this, you can see that Group A has this year and historically this has been the case always voted more for showing value and consulting with the business than group b and i found that a bit a bit concerning because i think this is core to the success of our practice our practice but if i then cut the data and only look at the people who are actually working in workplace learning and development there's a different answer. So here we've got two tables. The right-hand table is who's in Group B in general. The left-hand table is who's in Group B in the workplace. And here you can see that 
people who are in the workplace are more interested in showing value and they're much more interested in consulting more deeply with the business. And in fact, the overall vote in Group A for consulting with the business is really dragged down by people in education who I, I guess quite understandably don't really see that as being something that's important for them. So I'm actually given hope here. And I think that that makes me feel that there is, there is good news around the possibility that showing value, showing impact will become more widely adopted and something we should be thinking about. One last thing I want to look at, oh sorry, two last things I want to look at uh, before we go into Q&A. So firstly, our response to, to COVID-19. In March, April, May of last year, I was talking to a lot of people who were suffering a great deal in L&D and wanted to know, were we ever going to get out of this? Okay, um, a good, quick answer to Joanna here, because she's raised a, a methodological point, and I want to just do this. So Joanna's saying, how come N is different for the showing values table versus the overall G GSS results? Um, the, if I'm correct in your question, Joanna, I'm going to try to answer it now. If I don't answer it correctly, please put it, the question back in chat. N here in each case is referring to a subgroup of the people that I polled. So group B is the people who responded to email out of the total population of 3,114. And here the um, N is 614 for the particular group of people within group B who work in workplace learning and development. So uh, I'm going to carry on, but then at the end, if we have time, I'll come back and answer the question. Okay, fine. I, I spent a lot of time with an Excel spreadsheet trying to make sure that I've got stuff that is that I can really be sure I can show honestly to everybody. So thank you for raising the point. I think it's really important to, to, to check people's um, methodologies. So I was talking to people last year about this. There were two things going on in people's mind last year. Firstly, there was the business of adapting. Suddenly, we had to do an awful lot of stuff online. We adapted to the immediate shock. We also thought, well, it's going to end. At some point in the future, we'll be advancing forward. My key point here about responding to what happened last year and actually taking advantage of it is that in the middle, we have to have a new phase of adopt, where we adopt consciously new practices. That's different from the adapt phase. The adapt phase is we're just in hell. We're going to do what we need to get out of here. The adopt phase is where we calm down a bit and we say, right now, we're going to start doing things deliberately in a new way in order so that we can be in a new stable position to advance forward. This is how this table builds up. And you'll get these slides so that you can, um, you can check them out afterwards because I'm going to go through this quite quickly. Um, the key thing here is that in the adapt phase, we were just trying to get things done. We were doing the old things in new ways. A typical example is people taking an eight hour classroom course and putting it into an online eight hour classroom course, which is a really bad idea. At some point in the future, we don't want to be doing that. We want to have new ways of learning, new things done in new ways. So we don't do an eight hour classroom course. Maybe you have one and a half hours online. And the rest of it is a combination of uh, asynchronous work and pulling down information and so on. You don't get from adapt to advance by mistake. It happens with a conscious process of adoption in the middle. And in the course of this process, I think there is an area of focus we have for ourselves. There's a pace we go at. And most importantly, there's the business of risk. And I, my concern is that right now, this year, and probably not the whole year, probably the next six months, we have an opportunity to take what's happened and build a new future for learning and development that's based on really focusing on value and really working with the business. And if we don't do that, there's a real risk that we just keep being tactical deliverance. That's the big orange box in the bottom right hand corner. We've got a chance to go strategic, to really have good conversations with the business about value. And if we don't have those conversations now, we're going to be stuck with the stuff we did to just adapt to COVID-19 last year which is all about trying to get training done in difficult circumstances. And the last time this happened was 20 years ago, 2001, when the Twin Towers came down and air traffic in the US was stopped. And because of that, 
a lot of stuff went online. And that just meant that people got their PowerPoint decks, they put them online, and they put a click next button onto them. And that was an immediate adapt response, but we never adopted anything from that. And that became the pattern for e-learning after that. And it took us about 10 years at least to get rid of the shackles of people expecting e-learning to be really boring and dull. And to an extent, we haven't got rid of it yet even now. We have to consciously throw off the new bad practice that we created last year, as well as the old bad practice that already existed, and go forward in advance with a new great way of doing L&D in our organisations. So, I'm lo lots of great stuff coming through here and <laughs> uh, uh, coming through here in the questions. We are going to get to them. We've got uh, 14 minutes left. I'm looking around at all my clocks and everything here. I want to quickly go through one last thing. What about us? Don, be specific. What can we do? Right, the first thing I'm going to say is, please, please, the most important thing we can do is connect with each other personally, build your profile. Also build your skills because you don't know what's happening to you and your job in the next 12 months. Uh, it, it, I get loads of LinkedIn requests from people who say, I'm about to leave my job. Yes, I'm happy to link in with you, but it's too late. The time to start building your LinkedIn profile is right now because in a year's time, two years time, who knows what's going to happen. Build your profile now. We know that that's how people get jobs. So just talk about you specifically, please look after yourself, but also build your skills because it's your skills base that's really gonna help you understand what, what's out there. As you build the skills, you understand more about the world. It's not just a matter of getting the new skills. You become more employable, but also you, get, you develop your understanding. And most importantly, leave the office. I'm going to explain very quickly what I mean by leave the office now. I have this thing which I call the perspectives grid, um, where, um, On this horizontal bar, you've got learning and development and the organization. And vertically, you've got external and internal. So the bottom left hand corner is internal within the learning and development department. That's what we do. <laughs> Anne has asked, is anybody actually in the office? No, OK, I'm not talking physically anymore in the office. Fair enough. And some people are. But um, let's just use the word work to, to mean anything that is to do physically or non-physically. Internally, within our organization, we can, be, we can be expert, and we have to be expert, at what our own, own learning and development department does. But that is about 25% of the job. Just being good at what we do and our internal processes and procedures is by no means enough to be successful in what we need to do. As well as being expert at what we do internally, we have to look outside, come to events like this, Go to other things that are free, even pay for a conference occasion, that'd be fantastic. Hook up with people, network with people, get out and get engaged with external learning and development. So internally be expert and be engaged externally. You've got to be aware of what's happening outside your organisation, outside learning and development, in the outside world. Classic case is Brexit. If you weren't aware of Brexit and you weren't thinking about it in the UK, suddenly you found yourself having to produce people with a whole lot of new skills. I know people in the city of London who are having to recruit people now who retired 20 years ago just because they have skills of dealing with Europe that everybody else has forgotten or never developed. But the most important thing here is almost certainly to be connected with our organisation. So when I say get out of the office, I don't mean it physically necessarily, but I do mean go out and connect with your organization in particular. So inside your organization, but outside L&D, and have the listening conversations where you find out what's going on. Let's conclude and let's go to Q&A. The five takeaways. Everyone's talking about reskilling and upskilling. It has a whole lot of definitions. Maybe they don't all agree, um, but nonetheless, there's important stuff happening here. Watch this space, more to come. Collaborative learning this year has definitely moved from theory to practice. We're actually doing it properly. You know what, actually, People are doing it for themselves. Hot technologies are out of favour this year. People are too busy doing stuff. And the core of L&D practitioners will have a new focus in 2021, which is value. So this year, if we build on solid foundations, getting out of the office, filling up all the boxes in that quadrant, having tough conversations with people, and focusing on working with the business, 
Now I think we've got a solid foundation to build strategic influence. And I'm given hope by the fact that people are talking about focusing on the business, by the fact that workplace learning and development do see consulting more deeply with the business as being important. Those things really give me hope here that there's going to be a core of people this year, a core of learning and development practitioners who are going out and building a good strategic um, view of learning and development. So that's the report, the full report. Uh, you can down, you can read the summary, you can download the report itself there. I'll just drop the, uh, the link into the chat. That'll come up again in a second. And that's probably time for us to go into a wrap-up section and for me to start answering some Q&A. So we've got the links here in the middle at the top um, for the summary of the report. Stay in touch with me. I always say it's the end of a presentation, but I hope the beginning of a conversation, feel free to link in. Um, and also in the middle there, all, that, all those links from Hannah, about uh, OEB, they're there as well. I'm going to take five minutes now just to answer some, some of the questions here. I'm going to go back to the beginning. Um, there's, there's, and I think, I think mobile has dropped down a bit. Um, I'm, I'm, I think it's less of a, a priority now. People aren't thinking it's hot. It's partly because of lockdown, but it's also because it's now business as usual. I think it's just falling down because, hey, we do that. It's much less of a hot topic than it's been in the past. James was talking about virtual classrooms not appearing in the list, but now used everywhere. Uh, for a lot of people, they're not the same. They shouldn't be the same, you're right, as formal face-to-face -face classrooms. Do you think a different category will emerge for virtual classrooms? I might put it on, and indeed, James, in the other section and in the how will your work change section, lots of people talking about virtual classrooms, but I almost feel that virtual classrooms will be superseded by the use of events like this and uh, forums like this for things that go beyond what's instruction to a much more collaborative way of working. So yes, I think there will be a category there which is bigger than the virtual classroom and is more to do with uh, online, if you like, collaboration. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that falls into the social bit. It's a bit difficult. Now, Thomas says the drop in AI is strange. Surely, surely the new technologies would make it explode. I, 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 Yes, you'd think so, Thomas, but I think what happened was people were so caught up with just trying to get the day job done last year that those big things like AI and VR just never got a look in. They were put to one side, they will come back, and they may come back bundled in with something else like a learning platform. But I just think people were too focused on trying to get other stuff done. Uh, like Charles, I like your point about uh, liking methodologies versus liking technologies. Yeah, uh, it, it is interesting, isn't it? And I, I was surprised by that as well. But it is true that the, the people who are most passionate about new stuff tend to focus on a new methodology, but it's the technology that tends to get adopted. Uh, James, James and, uh, and Thomas having a conversation about AI. Ian was saying, what about the topic of specifically remote leadership as an L&D topic? Well, okay, to come back to the point that was made earlier about wellness and well-being, I, I, I'm not going to, I haven't put that in as a separate topic, Ian, but it is interesting that when people were talking about how their practice will adopt this year, there was a lot of focus on the need to provide training for people for leadership remotely. Absolutely. That was a real topic that people came up with. The other big topic that people came up with was indeed wellness. So those are two areas. Or, uh, sorry, and of course, being able to do things digitally. So the three things that were big in, in the how will your work change in terms of the content people will deliver is, firstly, helping people work digitally. Secondly, helping leaders uh, lead digitally. And thirdly, wellness and well-being generally. So thank you for raising that point. Um, Thomas has got quite a long question there. Marla in the Yeah, it makes perfect sense what you've written there. I think that is just too long, too complex a thing for most people to get their heads around at the moment, Thomas. But I think it will happen eventually. I think AI is going to permeate every part of learning and development. Yeah, James has raised a good point. You might want to have a chat about it. We need a new name for these events. They're not webinars, they're not seminars. What are they? If you've got some thoughts about that, please answer James's uh, observation in the chat area. Now, Hannah has said, is anybody working with an internal mobility department? And you know, some people I know are, um, and I'm, I'm slightly surprised we didn't get more feedback on that, but 
there are lots of organizations working right now. And this is a longer term trend for L&D, no question, which is that you're going to, you can expect to see people moving their recruitment process and people closer to their L&D people so that internal mobility becomes related to external mobility and the talent pool that we pick from when we're trying to, trying to choose for a job will blur so that you're looking at internal and external candidates quite frequently. And to your point, Thomas, this is one area where AI will have a big effect because there's going to be an explosion in applications doing what's called skills inference, where you go out and you just infer from people's activities what skills have they got and you use that to understand what skills, what jobs might they be good for in the future. That's quite a big thing. But Mariella has got an internal mobility policy and procedure, but it's on hold. Um, yeah, Joanna and, and going back to James and Anne and Patrizia's point, it is interesting how cl virtual classrooms have changed. What I've observed is there's been a huge, it's, it's a pyramid. So there's been a huge adoption in the basic level of use of, of uh, virtual classrooms. On top of that, there's actually some quite skilled use. And then on top of that, there's some really good programs being put together, cohort-based learning, where people are going through things in a group, coming together for sessions like this, going up and doing activities, typically challenging projects, coming back to report them. So uh, I haven't got any research on that myself, uh, but I'm sure it exists out there. There's no doubt that virtual classrooms have not just grown in number, but also in sophistication. Yeah, James, James is right about AI uh, and a lot of the questions on the, ter on the uh, options on the list, which is they do tend to be quite wide terms that cover a lot of ground. And I tried to avoid that and I was hoping I was doing that with reskilling and upskilling, but no, that turned out to be a very wide, um, a very wide uh, bracket. Now, Fona says, you mentioned something about learning experience platforms earlier. Yes, I, I do have uh, examples, but I'm, I'm in a peculiar position, Fona. I, I work for an institute. I do a lot of work with learning technologies. I do work with OEB. I can't, I can't mention in a public forum like this, anything around a, a learning experience platform without being seen to be um, uh, endorsing one person's product. But if you want to link in with me, I'm very happy to share with you all my thoughts about LXPs, learning experience platforms, and my link is up there in the top in the middle of the uh, uh, screen. Great question from, uh, yeah, James has put his, uh, James has put his LinkedIn uh, address there. I totally recommend getting in touch with James. He is a great guy for any form of uh, online, but particularly using the Adobe Connect platform. Um, Charles raises a great question here. I'm going to have answer this one, then wrap up, um, which I, I love this question. If we can't or decide not to return to as much face-to-face -face as before, how do we ensure the social networking part of LMD events is honoured? It's a great question. I, it's something I put to everybody in the room because I think it's something we all have to bear in mind. We can get close to it with this. We can provide things online that we can't provide face to face in terms of continuity between events, definitely. How can we get that face to face experience, the nuance of meeting people? I think there are ways of doing it with tools like Zoom or anything where you can have a face to face interaction with a small number of people. But I think we have to build it in. It will not happen by itself. And if we really want to ensure that people are getting a rich social experience, in a largely online world, I think we have to be wary of that. So Charles, I think that's a great point to wrap up with. I'm gonna hand you back now to Hannah. Thank you to everyone for all your great thoughts and interactions during the course of the webinar. Hannah, uh, over to you. Thank you, Don. And uh, thank you also to everyone yeah. for joining and participating yeah. and sharing your thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, as mentioned, and as you'll see here on the on the screen, if you would like to apply to become a speaker at OEB or learn more about it, uh, about the conference, then feel free to get in touch with me. Um, you'll find my, my contact details everywhere and also the links to our social media channels to follow us. Now, before logging off, uh, we would still appreciate it if you could take a moment to share your feedback in the poll. Um, Don, can you make the poll appear on your screen, uh, on everyone's screen? So there's a couple of questions there. But um, yeah, this was all from us. Um, 
and we thank everyone uh, for participating. Don, especially, uh, thanks for uh, for this great session, and um, we we'll leave this all open for a little bit. And uh, that was all from us. Thanks very much. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, everybody, for your participation. Great to uh, have spent the time with you. Bye for now.